So that's the sermon for today, so I'll see you later. <laughs> Uh-oh, well, okay. Actually, I can't possibly do any better than that, and if one or two of those quotes uh, was something you remember, I do know that you'll leave this place with a, a new sense of prayer. We've been talking about the last couple of weeks, meeting the real God in prayer, and we've been this summer taking a look at different people that meet God and sometimes the messy times of their lives. And last week, we looked at how God was met by a man by the name of Abraham. Today, we're going to take a look at how God meets his wife, Sarah. And so we're going to be, again, looking at chapter 18 of the Genesis, book of Genesis. Let me read it, the section for you today. So the Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre, while he was sitting at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day, Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. And when he saw them, he hurried to the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, If I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. And then let me get you something to eat so that you can be refreshed and then go on your way now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered, do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three seahs of the finest grain and knead it and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant so, who hurried to prepare it. He brought them some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. And while they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where is your wife, Sarah? They asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah had, were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, Am I, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, Yes, you did laugh. So last week we took a look at... Abraham's conversation with these three strangers on that fateful day, and we learned some things about how we can approach God in prayer from the pattern of Abraham this week, last week. This week, I want us to consider how Sarah gives us a sense of how to respond in prayer as we look at her mysterious um, encounter with these three guest that day. Now, we might be tempted when we first look at the story to consider that uh, they arrive at the tent and that everyone immediately understands, Abraham and Sarah immediately understand who it is that these three are. And that's the reason why, by the way, they hurried from the entrance of the tent. That's why Abraham met them and bowed low. That's the reason why, in verse 3, he says, If I found favor in your eyes, my Lord, don't pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then all you may wash your feet, rest under the tree. Let me get you something to eat so that you can be refreshed, and then go on your way now that you have come to your servant. So he went to all this effort because Abraham immediately realizes that this person coming to him that day is God who has come. But I am not convinced at all that when those three first showed up, they knew who these three beings were. I suspect that they were just really practicing the same kind of hospitality that all Bedouins practice, even today when you live in the desert. When you live in the desert, hospitality is just not, not just a nice thing to do. 
Hospitality is a matter of life and death. Hospitality is essential to surviving if you live in a desert. So I don't really think they knew who these three were at the beginning. In fact, Hebrews 13 says as much as well. Listen, Paul or the book of Hebrews reflects back. So don't forget to practice hospitality to strangers. For by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. And so Abraham and Sarah are not showing hospitality here because they realize at the get-go that these are divine beings. In fact, when you read the passage closely, you discover that it's not until verse 10 that they really discover who these three are. Before that, there's really no indication of their identity. When they first speak, that's back in verse 5 at the end, very well, they answered, do as you say. Verse 9, where is your wife Sarah, they asked. It's not until verse 10 that we're told that one of them speaks, and it's not until verse 13 we're finally told who that one actually is. Then the Lord, verse 13, said to Abraham. And so one of the things this whole mystery and surprise of this encounter reminds us of is that when God comes to us, he often catches us by surprise. We don't always know immediately that it's him who is speaking. We don't always realize immediately that this is the moment he wants to come to us. Sometimes we're pretty sure that if we just, you know, open our Bible in the morning, grab a cup of coffee, and just be quiet for a minute, immediately God will come to us. And often he will, but that's not the only time. In fact, many times the most deeply powerful moments of encounters with God don't happen when you're sitting in your favorite chair in the living room. Sometimes it's in that moment when you've lost someone and and you're in such desperation that you don't know where else to go. That's when he meets you. You're surprised by it. I'm always struck by that psalm in which the psalmist says, If I make my way to heaven, there you are. If I find myself in hell, there you are. See, now it's not surprising to meet God when you have a heavenly moment in life. The surprise is when you find yourself in hell and you turn around and discover that even there he is there. And that's what we discover that so often he meets us in those surprising moments. He catches us by surprise. And so when you think about meeting God, don't limit those moments to times that are predictable for you. Be open to allowing him to come to you at all kinds of different moments along the way. Now, it had been some time earlier, years earlier, in fact, that God had first come to Abraham and had given him a promise that one day, God had said, you're going to have a son, and that son will bring forth a great nation, and from that great nation will come a savior. And so God had said to Abraham years earlier, I'm going to save the world through your family, so Abraham, get ready. Now, almost certainly when God came to Abraham way back then, that Abraham had told his wife Sarah what had occurred, but it's unlikely, I suspect, that he had told really anybody else. I mean, who would have believed him if he had told other people? They would have laughed at him. Yeah, my wife and I, yeah, we're around 90 or so. We're expecting. Well, not yet, but soon. I think probably Abraham kept it to himself. He and Sarah. And yet... When this stranger shows up, verse 10, he says, I will surely return to you about this time next year. Sarah will, your wife, will have a son. Now, can you imagine 
Abraham's knees weakening as he hears this stranger say these words and then suddenly realize that the only other person anywhere who could possibly know about this promise that was made to him so many years before was the one who had made the promise himself. This could only be the one who had been the promise maker. God had come to him back then. But now God comes again. Now this time he doesn't just come to Abraham. See, if you read back in chapter 15, you'll discover that, that there was a moment when God came to Abraham in a, an ominous moment. And in fact, it's one of the most ominous, ominous uh, uh, chapters in the whole book. It talks about, let me read it, when the sun had set, darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared. And that was the presence of God making this covenant with Abraham. In the darkness, in the dread of night. But now, in this chapter, suddenly he's showing up again, but not in the darkness, not in the dreadful night. He's coming in the brightest time of the day. He's coming in the laziest time of the day. It's siesta time and the, he's coming in the most approachable kind of a way. Three guys show up. They don't look particularly unusual. But this time he's coming not so much for Abraham. He's coming to talk to Sarah. He has something he wants to say to her. In fact, that's the first thing they say. It's, Where's Sarah? They asked after they'd settled down and eaten. Well, she's in the tent, Abraham said. And that is when the Lord said, I will surely return to you this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Well, what's God doing here? He, he wants Sarah's attention. He wants her to hear this. He wants to talk with her. He has come to let her know that he is establishing her as a part of this promise and this faith. But he comes to Sarah in a vastly different way than, than he'd come to Abraham so many years prior. And that's generally often the case. He doesn't come to everybody the same way. I'm always, and many of us have enjoyed the Chronicles of Narnia series, and one of the things you learn from the Chronicles of Narnia is that, that you never get to Narnia the same way. One person ends up getting in through the back of the wardrobe. The next person just gets splinters in their mouth from bumping into the back of the wardrobe. And it's the true when it comes to encountering God. Everyone meets him in their own unique way. Abraham had first met him in the thick darkness of chapter 15, a burning fire pot, a, a dread gloom it speaks about. But now when he comes to Sarah, he comes in the most gentle of ways in the afternoon, lazy time of the siesta. So that's the second thing I'll suggest about when God comes to us. He meets each of us in different ways. Verse 10, then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now, Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent, which was behind him, Sarah and Abraham and Sarah were already very old. Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? What's this pleasure she's speaking about? Well, remember, she's not saying these words out loud. She's thinking them. So what is this pleasure she's referring to? Well, we might think the pleasure is she's old, she's well past her childbearing years, and she's wondering if she might just have this pleasure of having a son at this age. 
It's not a bad conjecture. It's just not what that word pleasure means. The word pleasure here is the word for sexual pleasure. Sarah is thinking, well, Abraham and I, we're not even sleeping together anymore. Now, the reason they're not sleeping together is not only because they're in their 90s. It's clear when you read Genesis 16 that Sarah's infertility had led to, led to this great sense of tension and estrangement between the two of them. Abraham, a man of his time, was deeply, had to have been deeply disappointed that Sarah was still childless. Because in that culture, a, ch a person, a woman's childbearing ability was really everything. A, a woman's children were her worth. A woman's children were her reputation, were her honor, were her pension plan. Your ability to bear kids was everything in that day for a woman. Of course, he never thought about it being a man's fault. So the woman is the one who at this moment, if she can't have children, was the focus of distress and disgrace by everyone. Now we're going to learn more about this in a couple of weeks when we talk about Hagar and how all of that transpires. But being childless in this time was such a source of shame and disappointment. And because of that, there had been this great distance between the two of them. The lack of sexual intimacy is not just a matter of their age. There's a distance between the two of them for years now, and it's a distance in more ways than just one. But now God comes to Sarah that afternoon and says, I'm going to give you a miracle child. But he doesn't say, but it's going to be apart from sexual activity, so you just sit tight, would you? I mean, God could have done that. God could have just miraculously given this child to Sarah without any sexual involvement and activity. I mean, he will do that, won't he? A couple thousand years later with another, a young virgin this time. But this promised child to Abraham and Sarah was not going to be immaculately conceived. That's not what's happening here. God shows up that day. But he shows up not only to prepare them for this child. He also shows up to bring healing to this marriage, this intimacy that they have long since given up on. And apparently, that healing happened because within the next year, the whole debacle between Hagar and Ishmael and how that had broken their marriage had been healed. And not too long after that, Sarah brings forth this son, Isaac. Because again, God came to not just prepare them for this child, but also to repair their relationship. One year from now, God says to them, there's going to be a child born between the two of you. So don't just sit back and wait. Get busy. <laughs> when God comes to us, here's the second, third blank, he expects us to respond. When God comes to you, he, he expects you to respond. He's not going to do all of it. He expects you to respond. So how does... Sarah responds when God promises her this child. She laughs. And then ever so gently, we're told, God asks, why did Sarah laugh? Is anything, verse 14, too hard for the Lord? Actually, that word too hard, the amplified version gets it better, at least the whole nuance. Is anything too hard or too wonderful for the Lord. That's really what the word is about. Sarah, God is asking, is the reason you're laughing 
Because this seems too wonderful, too good to be true. Is that why you're laughing? See, the truth is there's really two kinds of laughter, aren't there? There's laughter from two very different sources. There's the laughter of hope, and then there's the laughter of hopelessness, a kind of cynical kind of laughter, the kind of laughter you hear with a joke that cuts and hurts and injures, and that cynical kind of laughter, that kind of skeptical kind of laughter, that kind of laughter of hopelessness, that's the kind of laughter Sarah has here. Because behind her laughter is this deep hurt that she feels. She's saying to herself, look at my life. I'm nothing. I, 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 I have nothing to give to my husband. I'm useless to him. I can't even provide my husband with an heir. I can't even give him the one thing, the one thing that every wife needs to give her husband. Do you know, she's asking, how it feels to have to direct your husband to another woman because you can't provide the one thing you and your life are supposed to provide. Do you know the kind of humiliation that is? Do you know the kind of shame I feel? I laugh, she says, so I won't start crying. But God says to Sarah that day, I'm going to turn that laugh that has covered up your broken heart all these years into another kind of laughter, a laughter of delight, a laughter of wonder and joy. And that's actually what happened. Within a year, we're told, we read that she does indeed have the child. In fact, we read it in verse 21. It's one of the most beautiful passages, I think, of the book. The Lord cared for Sarah, as he had said and did for her, what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant, gave birth to a son for Abraham in his old age. Everything happened at the time God had said it would. And Sarah said, verse 6, God has made me laugh. Everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. No one thought that I would be able to have Abraham's child, but even though Abraham is old, I have given him a son. And do you know what they named that child? Isaac. And do you know what that name Isaac means in Hebrew? Laughter. Because God had turned the laughter of hopelessness into the laughter of joy and wonder. In fact, that's the fourth blank. God wants to turn our laughter from hopelessness and the hurt and disappointments we feel into the laughter of joy and delight and wonder. Now, some of you here listening today, as you kind of look at this whole theme of meeting the real God or just evaluating your own life of talking to God, when you're honest, you may well say, well, my, my relationship with God is pretty nominal, frankly. I, truth is, keep him at arm's length. And the reason... I keep him at arm's length is, well, this is all too hard to swallow. This whole thing of faith is just too hard to believe. But what I'm struck by is the fact, C.S. Lewis once said it, the problem most people have with Christianity is not that it's too hard to believe. The problem most people have with Christianity is that it's too wonderful to believe. That we're like children and we are spending our summer afternoons in a mud puddle making mud pies and pulling our truck out and 
filling it with mud, thinking, well, this is kind of what life's supposed to be. We're filled with dirt and covered with mud, and that's just what life's about. When somebody comes to us and says, are you tired of spending your life full of mud and dirt? How, how would you like to, instead of spending your time with mud pies here in the middle of a street, how would you like to spend your time with that truck of yours on the beach, enjoying the sand and the surf of the ocean? And the child says, what's the sand and the ocean? That's, I don't even know what that is. And, and, and sometimes the whole reality of the gospel is so wonderful. We, we can't believe there is such a thing where we would be so freed. We, we're confined, certainly, to just kind of slugging it out with the mud that we end up spending our life with. See, in fact, one of the reasons that we love to spend time, at least most of us do with children, is because their, their lives are so filled with wonder. I mean, every day is a new adventure for them. They, they see the world through those eyes of, of astonishment. But as we get older, don't we? The older we get, the harder it is to keep that sense of wonder alive. alive. Now, it's worth noting how gentle God is here with Sarah. You laughed, God says. No, I didn't, Sarah says, lying back to him. And what does God say? You dare to lie to me, God? That's not what he says. He says, yeah, you did laugh. I want you to see what you did. I want you to see the kind of cynical heart, the kind of hardened place that you find yourself today. I want you to see the lack of wonder and joy in your life. Do you see that, Sarah, in that laugh of cynicism that you've just shown? Do you see that? So how do you discover or rediscover joy when your life has been filled with so much disappointment as had Sarah's at this point. Well, many years later, a man by the name of Apostle Paul would write a letter by the name of today we call Galatians. And in it, he refers back to Abraham's life. Listen from chapter 4. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and the other by a free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, But his son by the free woman was born as a result of a divine promise. For it's written, Be glad, barren woman, you who never bore a child. Shout for joy and cry aloud, you who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. What Paul wants to do is contrast the difference between a religion of works and this gospel of free grace and giftedness. And he is saying Hagar shows us and exemplifies the idea of religion by works. That is, her value, who she was, how she felt about herself was tied up with the fact that she was fertile, that she provided a son for Abraham. She prided in her, herself in her abilities. And that's what religion wants to constantly invite us to do, to, to base our value and our worth on what we can do. On the other hand, the gospel says that your value, well, it isn't tied up with what you do. Your righteousness, your worthwhileness is not dependent on your successes, your abilities, your fertility. It's, it's based on understanding that Jesus is your righteousness. Jesus is your gift and 
the place you find that worth. And when you base it with him, you're free to be fruitful in all kinds of different ways. Fruitful in what way? Well, look at verse 22, 33 of Mark's gospel where, where you read the story of how people, how Jesus responds when he hears that some family members, his mom and brother and sister, are waiting outside. And he says something to the people around him that's just absolutely radical. He says, so who are my mother, my brothers? He looked at them, those seated in the circle around him, and, he, and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. See, in a day and age when family was absolutely everything, and if you had no kids, you were worthless. In that age, Jesus says, people matter to God whether they have a family or not. People matter to God whether they have the moral strength or the, the good record or the, the fruitfulness of all the things we think matter to our culture. See, Hagar, Hagar represents the fertile woman who has all these abilities, and Sarah represents a woman who has no fertility, no abilities, but because she trusted in this promise, she's the one that was the, the child of hope. And so when we finally put our trust and in the grace of God, the barren woman can be more fruitful than anyone else. And so what Paul is saying is, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you find yourself uh, lo living a life full of success and achievement or when you look at your life and it's full of disappointments and loss and discouragement. Who you are, who you're loved by, is not dependent on those things. You've been given this gift of God's grace. And when you receive that, you're free to be fruitful in all kinds of different ways. How are you fruitful when you don't have kids? Well, he's talking about how we can impact our world around us. That the kids that Jesus is speaking about, the family that Jesus loves, are all those people in ways that we are a blessing to this world around us. So, when we finally realize that it's not what we do that makes us who we are, when we finally get that, when we finally realize it's all what Christ has done, and that's when we find ourselves laughing before God in a, a laugh of joy, in a laugh of disbelief. Could this possibly be true? It's too good, it seems to be true. But no, it's actually too good not to be true. And that's the great news of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful for this story of a woman who finds herself filled with self-loathing and filled with pain and hurt and disappointment, and yet how you turn that into joy and wonder, and how you long to do that with all of us. When we give up trying to find our value and worth in what we do, and allow your righteousness to be the thing that we cling to. And so, Lord, keep our eyes focused on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.